with Delegate John Hardy. Good morning, Mr. Hardy. Speaking of a little bit out there, I mean, it's a great segue, <laughs> right? So, yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Hey, you, you were talking about, we uh, had discussed, uh, everyone, is this morning the situation at the Key Bridge in Baltimore. You were talking about going over that bridge many times yourself. Yeah, I've been, been across that bridge, you know, going into Dundalk. Uh, my, my wife's family is originally from the Baltimore area, the suburbs of Baltimore, and there's a Captain Harvey's cheesesteak place down there that they're really, you know, ex get excited about. So they go down that way to get those cheesesteaks and been across that bridge bridge many times it's a very sad day a very uh you know very heart heartfelt uh you know about the people that were working on the bridge the people crossing the bridge uh the first responders that are responsible for um you know what they're doing today and and the many days and weeks and months ahead just a very sad situation and uh it's really going to affect the port of baltimore port of baltimore is a huge port and i did hear reports earlier today that there was a pilot on the ship that was piloting the ship so i, I have a feeling we're probably going to end up finding out it was probably some type of mechanical failure electrical failure mm -hmm. hopefully I, you know i hope it wasn't right. some something like that but uh yeah just a really sad day to to uh for people that have lost their lives and and uh just the uh, the effect that that will have on the uh, Baltimore area and uh, the port of Baltimore. Yeah, there was uh, about 10, 12 years ago, there was a situation over on the Bay Bridge where a semi had knocked a car into the water. Hmm. Uh, of course, the bridge hadn't collapsed. Uh, in this particular case, we're talking about an entire, uh, well, not the entire bridge, it's the, the spans that are over toward the land on either side into the water are still standing, but the middle portion is just gone. Yeah, you know, West Virginia had its own uh, bridge catastrophe mm -hmm. um, in, in Point Pleasant. It was called the Silver Bridge, I think is what it was called, and it uh, it collapsed. It was right around Christmas. It was maybe a couple of days before Christmas or a couple of mm -hmm. days after Christmas. There was a major collapse, and uh, people lost their lives in the Point Pleasant area, people from the Ohio area. Uh, I can't remember exactly what that happened. It might have happened like in the 70s or something. Yeah, I was thinking late was, 60s yeah, or it was, something. It was a failure. It was a failure in the bridge construction, mm -hmm. and one one failure became a catastrophic failure. So West mm -hmm. Virginia has um, endured one of those uh, horrible bridge failures mm -hmm. too. Well, if you've seen the video, this these uh, container ships, these cargo ships, you ever see a truck with the um, M-A-E-R-S-K on the back of a uh, oh, yeah. trailer? Yeah. That's These come from these container ships, right? And we, you see it hit that support and the speed at which that bridge just yes. buckled yeah. and collapsed yeah. after that was striking. Yeah, I just watched a video during the break for the first time. I had heard it on the news, you know, through the radio, but had not yet seen the video. And, yeah, it's very striking. That's a huge amount it. of mass in, in motion. Yeah. And, you know, when that, amount of, when that amount of mass is in motion, it mm. is when it hits an, an inanimate object, it's going to do some serious damage. Yeah. John, well, yeah, how old is that? How old is that bridge? Any idea? I heard him say it took five years to construct it. Yeah. So a long bridge, I know yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, John, let's talk about the legislative session. And uh, I know you had a couple of comments you wanted to make about education because of an interview we had done previously. But I wanted, if you could, first address the backlog of bills that come from the Senate after a crossover day that the House then is basically forced to consider in 12 days when you consider that you got to have three readings to get it through at the end. Do we want to talk about good bills or bad bills? Anything you want to address? You've been there. Uh, you know, I mean, years. at least I've heard some senators taking some shots at the House this year. So uh, my good friend, Senator Barrett, and my good friend, Patricia Rucker, taking a few shots at the House this year. The House is, and, 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 and that's all in jest. Um, the the house does work completely different than the senate it's uh it, it's a little slower a little more methodical it's a little um, you're dealing with a lot more people. You're dealing with a lot more personalities. Uh, the Senate has the ability of having um, their members on a lot more committees, and they're able to speed speed line things a little quicker. Uh, we have more people, more committees, uh, minor committees. There's a, it's a longer process. We do not. It's always been since I've been in the House for the past six years. Um, the House does not take up Senate bills until crossover day. We 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 receive them, but we don't take them up in committee. Um, that's how it works on the finance committee. I think that's how it works in the judiciary. Uh, I'm not on judiciary. I spend all my time in the finance committee and I am on the health committee, but that's just how it's always worked. And, um, you know, I think it's a good way to try to maybe, uh, tighten up the time frame and weed out things that you don't want to run. I'm sure the Senate, you know, they have ways to weeding out things that they don't want to run from the house. And it's, it's a very unique process. Uh, this year was a little different than, than others. Very slow session. Uh, not, you know, really just not a lot going on uh, until the last like three weeks. It kind of got a little, when we got that clawback, it got a little, um, 
it got a little dicey in the finance committee when we got that word of that claw back and then our budget kind of blew up and and then uh we had a couple few little um mishaps with the senate finance committee versus the house finance committee i mean obviously you know if you want to talk about the social security tax cut bill you know that was an agreed to bill the governor wanted to do that bill in one shot which was about 37 million i think the house was okay with doing it in one shot the senate wanted to take a more measured approach and do a three-year phase in so i think you know the deal was struck with the senate finance and said yeah well, sure we'll do a three-year phase and it's more fiscally responsible to do that way um West Virginia's economy grows by about 140 to 150 million dollars a year just in natural growth. So that was kind of keeping the the uh, the cut of revenues below the percentage where we wanted it to be in the natural growth. And then all of a sudden that, that bill changed and it was tied to triggers and then the pay raise got tied to triggers. And so there was a there was a lot of gamesmanship at the end of the session with the budget. And if you remember correctly, the budget didn't get passed till 1030 the last night. And it's really a shell of a budget, but I'm, I'm at least happy that we were able to get a budget out. Now, you're going to hear some people probably in the next month or two saying that we shouldn't have passed a budget. We should have just went ahead and, you know, kicked the can till May. Uh, then we would have had all that money. And then it would have been it would be a spending frenzy. If we would have kicked the budget to May and we're sitting on all this money, it would have, and, and you're that late in, it would have been people would have really been holding things hostage to try to get the money that they wanted and, and it would be a spending frenzy. So I think that it's good that we went ahead and got the front of our budget done. Um, section nine of our budget, which is the back of the budget. We didn't put a lot of spending in that. I think that's, there'll probably be a one large amendment, like a striking insert to the budget probably done in May. We can do that because that budget hasn't taken effect yet. And then we can do all of our supplemental spending that we want to do in the back of the budget with, um, you know, surplus revenues, um, and, and probably one fell swoop. You mentioned the word hostage, and that's a little bit of inside baseball stuff there, so to speak, about how things work once you get down into Charleston and it's time to really pass bills. Uh, most of us, when we think about legislators getting together, the ideal scenario is, here's a bill. Do you like it or not? Vote yes or no. Does, is it good for the state? Is it good for people? Great, let's pass it. Is it not? All right, let's not. But that's not necessarily how it works because you want to get your bill passed. So you said we're going to hold hostage on somebody else's bill. Tell me what that means. Yeah, I mean, there's gamesmanship all over the place. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not above doing it myself. I mean, I, I did that earlier this year. I was needed on a vote and, and, and I had two people in my pocket and, you know, I was like, and I went to the leadership and said, hey, I can... I can be with, I can change my vote. I can be with you on this vote. I can bring two other people with you, but I need this. And and it, it ended up not coming to fruition because the bill got adjusted and there was a lot of adjustment to the bill that made it more applicable and more had, had a better taste for more people. So I kind of lost my leverage. But, you know, I mean, that's just part of the deal. And when you're down there working and, you know, people may say they don't they don't like that part of it or they don't like that, but that, it's a part of it. And if you're going to be you know, if you're going to be in the game, then you need to be able to understand how the game works. And, and that stuff really starts to happen in the last two weeks. There's not a lot of that in the first part of the session. It's, it's the last the last two weeks when the Senate's kind of holding on to stuff that they know the House wants. The House is holding on to things that the Senate wants. And then, you know, you can all of a sudden be a no on something to try. To, it, it's it's just part of it. And then it takes a couple of years to learn it. And, and it's really it's it's uh, it's just part of the process. John, can can you back up a little bit and just tell us a little bit about the back end of the budget, Section 9, and explain explain the difference, explain what the back end of the budget is. Yeah, so is. The, the back end of the budget is stuff that's not, it's, it's not going to be a base-building part of the budget. It's one-time spends. It's where we have excess revenue left over at the end of the year. So in July 1, when the new budget starts, any of the surplus revenue, or I'm sorry, ex, excess revenue from the previous year, how things are in the back of the budget in section nine is how they are funded. So let's say there's 15 things in the back of the budget, which we call section nine. They are funded um, as the money is left over as the position they are in. So if you're position two, you're second in line. And, and, and so, you know, you don't, you don't want to be position 18, but typically we've been running enough excess revenues that we've been able to fund those things that we want to fund. And those are always one-time expenditures, non-base building. They're not in the budget. We're not, um, locked in to have to spend that money next year. Um, so so that's where we, uh, and that's really where our, gov our our budget has grown. So like, 
you know, if you hear people talk about our flatland budget, our flatland budget is pretty flat line, what we put into our base building budget every year. But the back of the budget, the surplus budget, is where our budget has grown. And, and we've, we've done that because we can control um, – not bloating the budget every year. We we have the we have the control of only using that as a a one time spend. So you're not. It's the good part about that is there are things that need to get done, things you guys want to get done, but you're not locked in year to year doing them. And if you come to that year and all of a sudden there isn't enough money, just doesn't happen. Right. Exactly. And that's where we, you know every year typically we put an additional 150 million dollars into roads. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's always things that are back there that are things that we want to do that we really want to do. Uh, but we just want to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible with our base building budget, the things that we know that we have to pay for. I'm going to go back again to crossover day and that whole aspect of taking up bills. Who sets crossover day? And is that something that could be moved like, you know, uh, Senator Rucker earlier was talking about it's 15 days, but you've got to have three days to read the bill. So it's really about 12 days. And now suddenly you've got 12 days to look at 100 or 200 bills that are coming from the other side. Could that be shifted in any way to give more time at the end? Or Yeah, yeah so crossover day is set up in, in, in joint rules committee. So there's mm -hmm. rules of the legislature that are set up. Uh, the House sets up our rules every two years when we have a new legislature. Uh, I'm sure the Senate sets up their rules every four years. Uh, may maybe they do every two years. I'm not sure how the Senate does it. There's joint rules making that works between the House and the Senate. So that's how that's set up. Really, there is the full 15 days because if we really want to pass something, we can suspend rules. We have the, we have enough votes in the House to suspend rules and take things up and you know read them three times on one day and. I really think it's just a way to kind of control how much legislation we are passing. I don't think we need to pass 300 pills every year. I don't think we need to pass 200 pills every year. I've always said it should be a one for two. For every one we pass, two we take off the books. We have a lot of legislation that's antiquated, that's mm -hmm. that's just really no longer relevant. We need to clean the rolls, clean the books up. Do you um, have to pass bills to remove bills? We, you do. You Actually, you do. Exactly. A lot of times and there'll be code conflicts. So a lot of times when you pass a piece of legislation, there'll be a code conflict or there'll be an old piece of legislation that's in there, and we'll work to take that out. As we're passing the new legislation, we'll just... You know, you, you'll see like a lot of times there'll be like a title amendment or there'll be a, an amendment to the bill, which is like a committee amendment. And it just maybe takes some old um, antiquated language out. So it, and, and we try to do that as much as we can. But, uh, you know, I don't think we need to pass 300 bills a year. So do you have to have someone kind of looking back through past legislation all the time, kind of looking at what is good, what is not, what is still in use, what is not? Or uh, there's there's as many lawyers in the Capitol as there is legislators. I mean, every <laughs> and committee, they're doing that very every thing. committee has two to three to four to five lawyers. I mean, there's I mean, there's counsel everywhere. So there's mm -hmm. as many lawyers, you know, in the in the um, Capitol as almost as there is um Legislators, and then you also have the stakeholders. You have the people that are outside that work in the industry, that work in you know that that are paying very close attention to what you're doing, and it affects them. Uh, you also have the lobbyists who are you know working with their uh, clients, who are the stakeholders, to make mm -hmm. sure what we're doing, how it affects their everyday business or their operations. So there's plenty of eyes on everything. Okay. So. Um, I will tell you, when I come home from the legislature, I don't read anything for about three weeks. I, <laughs> I am just burnt out on reading. So, um, But, you know, it's it's a lot to keep up with, but it's very interesting work. And, you know, the, the people that are doing it now, I, I've, I have so much respect for them. The people that have done it for a long time, it, it's, it really is um, – uh, a really cool process Frush. some days you just feel like a rock star and other days you feel like a complete loser i mean it's just it's a it's a are you describing everybody's life yes yes, yes. yes. yeah i mean it really i mean it's a, it's a really uh, an, a, a, an awesome thing to be a part of and i'm glad i've had six years of it and and i'm ready to go do something different and i will miss the people i'll miss the process but i won't miss being away from home so much john last wednesday we had melissa power on who's a candidate once again for the board of education to be reelected. she had some comments about the legislature and its approach to education and education policy in west virginia i know you had some objections to some of the things that she had said well you know I, you know her personal feelings about 
other, you know, senators or delegates or her personal feelings. I think maybe it's a little unprofessional for an elected official who is a school board member to maybe talk that way about another elected official. But that's that's I'm not here to talk about that. That's her decision if she wants to talk derogatory about another elected official. But I do take pause with some of the things that she said in regards to the legislature. I mean, you know, we've given 25 percent in pay raises in the last five years. Um, you know, there's been a 5% pay increase almost every, every year that, that had not happened for many, many, many years until the Republicans took control. Uh, we've passed legislation that has given the local Berkeley County board of education a freedom in about 70% of their budget. Now they, they can spend that money they way, the way they want to. Now, you know, they can spend that money by putting more money in the classrooms, by giving more money to teachers. They can spend that money by having more administrators. You know, they have the freedom to spend that money the way they do. There's also a fund that the legislature puts $15 million into for uh, professional development that the counties, it's divvied out to the counties. Berkeley County has left money on the table every year. Every year there's money left in that fund that Berkeley County Board of Education doesn't take, adva take advantage of. You know, so now what's happening is the State Board of Education wants to start sweeping that money and using it for other things because the boards of education, not just Berkeley County, many boards of education are not taking advantage of all that money. So, you know, I, I, we, we, we have passed legislation that put a lot more of health care providers, nurses, um, psych, uh, um, uh, psychologists, uh, you know, a lot of other support staff in the schools, you know, to try to help the, the, the teachers and the behavioral stuff. We just passed a bill last year that's going to put aides in first, second, and third grade. You know, we, we understand education is frustrating, and, and it's not just – in West Virginia, I know that we continue to be in the bottom of the barrel, which is frustrating to me. Um, you know, I, I want us to succeed in our education and, and, and do very well. Um, I feel like we're spending the money, but we're not getting the returns. I will tell you that West Virginia is somewhere around 26, 27th in spending per pupil. We spend about $12,000, $13,000 per pupil. Um, so that's right in the mix of where you need to be. How much of that money is getting to the classroom? How much of that money is held up in administrative cost? I mean, how much is, you know, and, and you know, being a teacher is a tough job. I, I understand that. And there's teacher shortages across the country. It's not just West Virginia. And I understand Mrs. Powers, you know, her frustration, but please make sure your frustration is directed in the right direction because the legislature, we have definitely made education a priority. We've made edu ed educational choice. We've given families the, the ability to choose what they want to do for their education. We have tried to fund things the absolute best that we can fund it. Locality pay is just not something that's going to happen. I mean, I, I've, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, we've gotten closer on locality pay. Um, I don't know what the new flavor of the legislature will be in two years with the 30 new House members. Um, you know, I think there's a trend to start to move where we're putting money in into agencies for them to make their own decisions on how they're spending. But, you know, it's a, I understand there's frustration involved, but understand that the legislature has definitely made public education a priority, and we have spent as much money as we possibly can. And she was talking about the PEIA. Let's understand, the only thing that we did to PEIA was bring it back into balance. It was out of balance. We'd been stuffing money in the back door for years, and it was no longer an 80-20. So all we did was bring it back into balance, and people's um, – Premiums did go up and understand that their premiums went up, but they've been rising in the private sector for years. We've tried to offset those with pay raises with PEIA, and there's still a lot of work to be done with PEIA. But, uh, you know, if you get a 5% pay raise and a 10% raise in your PEIA, those numbers are not offsetting. That 10% rise in the PEIA is very, very small considered to the pay raise. So, you know, someone's PEIA goes up $17, their pay goes up $2,400. So, I mean, there's, 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 it's not a one-for-one -one trade off and, and I would like to have more information on the actual numbers of that to see how the offsets and the PEI is. I don't want to speak out of turn with that, but, but understand the legislature has made public education a priority. Well, and I mean, what a lot of people in the uh, public sector don't understand is the private sector health insurance has, you know, doubled, tripled. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. And what PEI, when, when I hear teachers and, and, public workers say, oh, I'm paying this much more. You are paying so much less than you would be paying on the outside. 
I mean, it's been subsidized like crazy, and you had to bring it in line a little bit. What I mean, what do you think can be done? I mean, you, you've been on the inside. What do you think can be done to improve our education system in West Virginia? Well, clearly, you know, money money is, is an important thing, and, and we've worked towards money. And I do believe that teachers in the Eastern Panhandle and some of the other counties, even, even some of the poorer counties, Made, way underpaid way, way right, underpaid exactly. so we definitely need to have more pay and, and locality pay obviously the cost of living in berkeley and jefferson county is much more than other counties and there should be some type of i mean the federal government's already figured it out for us i mean it can't be that hard if the federal government's got it figured out um you know and the military already has it figured out through your baq and, and that type stuff mm -hmm. so you know literally i understand that teachers and state troopers and you know doh we have 37 slots in our doh in berkeley county mm -hmm. we have 17 workers we can't hire people for doh we struggle with state police officers we struggle mm -hmm. with teachers and service personnel Understanding the cost of living is, is way more here. I mean, I just walked into a convenience store yesterday, and it was $18 an hour to start, to stand behind the register and just, you know. So, I mean, it, you, mm -hmm. we, we, the, the, the locality pay is very important. But as I was stating earlier, with some of the um, agencies now, when we, we are writing legislation giving agencies flexibility, we did it with CPS workers. So there's a, a be able to pay more, in the, in the in, and we also did it in um, – with our uh, jails, we have critical need, critical where, where there's critical need, there's critical need, and there's and there's different uh, bumps in the pay um, for that. So, uh, you know, I think that's probably the next the, how we're going to move forward. I like critical need because there is no more critical need than having qualified, good qualified teachers here in the Eastern Panhandle to teach our kids because there's a brain drain of teachers. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and and you know, teachers are really really frustrated with with behavior. I mean, mm -hmm. behavior is you know, I hear stories of children doing things that we would have never thought of doing. I mean, you know, I thought I was you know a little bit of I was mischievous. I was never bad, but I was mischievous, you know. And and I think we all had that, you know, mm -hmm. especially as like a nine ten year old boy, we're all mischievous. Can't sit still. Um, yeah, but there, <laughs> I mean, there is some really dangerous and. Um, you know, scary behavior that's going on in some of the schools and not mm -hmm. just the high schools. I mean, in the, the younger children. So, you know, I, I think at some point in time, the legislature, the state, uh, the country is going to have to make a, a hard decision to say, we are going to provide you with a free education, um, the best education that we can provide you with. But if you're, if you're, if you are not going to meet our behavior parameters, then your child's not going to be in our school. Yeah. But what happened to discipline? I mean, it used to be there was discipline, but now it seems like the, the, the idea of, you know, well, you have to take my kid. Well, no, I don't, you know. I mean, if... if well, if, you, the thing is you do, though, because the Constitution of the state, in most states, would say that you have to educate that child. That's the responsibility of the schools. Yeah, I, and, and, I, but, but that child also has to be able to fit within the parameters of that school. I can't not educate 25 kids because one kid in the class won't allow me to educate 25 kids. Right. We've got to find a way to deal with that one child, and it, you used to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I, and I believe Berkeley County, Berkeley County schools have done a good job. They, they've started the CARES program, the CARE Act. Mm -hmm. or CARE, I'm not exactly sure what it's called, but it's a program, a separate program, where they pull those students out and they get a little special one-on-one -on -one and mm -hmm. maybe a different classroom, and they try to figure out what's going on if there's right. problems at home. You know, most of this stuff just stems from problems at home. It's the breakdown of the nuclear family. It's the breakdown of just family values. And, and right. so so I think that they're working towards that. But you can't have special schools and special classrooms for all of these students that are it, – it's a mm. tough. It, well, it's tough. It's, it starts with fathers in the home. Yeah, That's, that's yeah. where it starts. Mm -hmm. And over the last 15 years, it's uh, spilled over into no parents in the home. We've got yeah. grandparents raising kids in this state. Not that it's not happening elsewhere, too, but it's happening way too much in West Virginia. 8,000 children in our foster care system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's Horrible. And grandparents are and doing the best that and they can. And everything coming over the border, all more drugs coming over the border. We're going to have more grandparents raising kids. This